This yes. is hell. Okie doke. Manufacturing descent since 1996. This is hell streaming live and podcast shortly after. During the week at thisishell.com, the world broadcast premiere of all four hours of every week's This Is Hell airs Saturday mornings from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. on Chicago Sound Experiment, WNUR 89.3 FM. You can also hear This Is Hell in an abbreviated one-hour version weekly on Radio Free Moscow in Moscow, Idaho, twice every week on Lumpen Radio at Lumpen Radio. Dot com, that's WLPNFM, and thrice weekly on the United Kingdom based online radio outlet Beware, which you can find at BewareTheRadio.com. And soon we are also going to be on yet another station crossing borders into Canada when we will be airing on CKUW in Winnipeg, Manitoba. So great to hear from the fans and Winnipeg, Manitoba, who apparently like our show so much they want to hear it on their local radio station. According to Bob Woodward's 2004 book, Plan of Attack, the definitive account of the decision to invade Iraq, and yes, I'm also surprised that we're quoting a Bob Woodward book, the Secretary of State Colin Powell, then Secretary of State Colin Powell, told President George W. Bush of the potential for a war in Iraq. He said, You're going to be the proud owner of 25 million people. You will own all their hopes, aspirations, and problems. You'll own it all. Powell and his Deputy Secretary of State Richard Armitage called this the pottery barn rule, as in you break it, you own it. After a 20-year war in Afghanistan, the U.S. and NATO have left Afghanistan broken, an urban-rural divide between town and country that could arguably be understood as predictable. As our guest today quotes Karl Marx, the town, the town already is in actual fact the concentration of the population, of the instruments of production, of capital, of pleasures, of needs, which the country demonstrates just the opposite fact, isolation and separation. This was the case during the U.S. and NATO occupation of Afghanistan. It was the case during the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan, and it was the case beforehand as well. So what can be done to assist the Afghan people during their ongoing humanitarian catastrophe they face from U.S. economic sanctions as well as the geopolitical competition between China, Russia, India, Pakistan, and Iran? Well, in a few minutes, we will try to figure all of that out when we will speak with political worker, writer, teacher Asim Sajad Akhtar, who wrote the Catalyst Journal article, Breaking Afghanistan. Asim teaches political economy at the National Institute of Pakistan Studies at Qaid e Azam University. Asim is a syndicated columnist who writes for Dawn, one of Pakistan's leading newspapers. He's author of The Struggle for Hegemony in Pakistan, Fear, Desire, and Revolutionary Horizons, which was just published by Pluto Press. He's also the author of The Politics of Common Sense, State, Society, and Culture in Pakistan. Asim was the president of the Awami Workers' Party's Punjab Executive Committee from 2014 to 2017. He works on diverse subjects such as state theory, informality, colonial history, and social movements. He's an honorary fellow at the Institute of South Asian Studies, a research institute at the National University of Singapore. And from 2002 to 2012, Asim was a coordinator of the People's Rights Movement, a confederation of working class movements in Pakistan, he was also a chairman of the All Pakistan Alliance for Kachi Abadis, that is, informal settlements or slums, which was an association of slum dwellers from across Pakistan. And you can follow Asim on Twitter at Asim Sajad A, that's A A S I M S A J J A D A. I'm your bitter, blind, broke, gap tooth radio show live streaming and podcast host, Chuck Mertz. Producing today is Dan Hill. Dan, how was your holiday weekend? It's a good holiday weekend. We made some hollow hollow. Excuse me? Yeah, it's a Filipino dessert where you make some shave, shaved ice and then layer it with different preserved fruits. It was delicious. Really? 
Yeah. That sounds fantastic. So it's like a, a, like a slushy and a yeah. smoothie put together? Kind of like a parfait, and then it's fun to make it. Good, clean fun to make it with everybody. The hollow, hollow. How do you spell that? H A L O dash H A L O. Oh, awesome. I got to try that. It's good. Check it out. I, I, I must check that out. I'm really looking forward to checking that out. My weekend sucked. I found out that, well, excuse me for one second. I found out that I had to cough. Uh, my weekend sucked. I found out that while I was in the hospital for two weeks in early March, undergoing several surgical procedures that kept me from doing the show for over two months, a friend of mine from college, well, at the time, he was going to college. I was very, very busy dropping out. A friend of mine passed away, possibly from complications caused by a serious car accident in which he was involved late last year. So there was a memorial service streaming online, which I attended virtually, of course, as my friend was a huge fan of music, attending thousands of concerts during his lifetime, often becoming friends with the musicians themselves. Uh, the service included musical performances from members of Rain Parade, a pioneering band of the 1980s Paisley underground scene in Los Angeles. Uh, the service began with a reading of a letter sent as a eulogy from Robin Hitchcock, originally of the Soft Boys and later the Egyptians, who had become a close friend with my friend. I heard a story about my friend that I will be sharing after our conversation with Asim. The story features my late friend and a 1990 sitcom star, now, I'm no fan of celebrity, but it's the kind of story my friend would have absolutely loved that I recounted here on This Is Hell, so I'll be sharing that in a bit. But more important than my own personal Memorial Day, Dan, what is this week's question from hell? This week's question from hell is, the right to which hobby do you want to see enshrined in a constitutional amendment. I've been trying to think of an answer for that question since I read it last night, and I still do not have one. I think it's going to take me all week to figure, figure it out because, really, stamp collecting? Do you need to have that protected by a constitutional amendment? I don't think that's necessary. Uh, you can leave your answer to this week's question from hell at our Facebook page, facebook.com slash thisishellradio, or you can direct message it to us at Twitter at thisishellradio. Or you can email it to me at chuck at thisishell.com, but we must have your answer by the end of this week's show when we are announcing this week's winner, as we do each and every week following Jeff Dorchin and the Moment of Truth. Dan will be sharing some of your answers to this week's question from hell following our conversation with Asim on Afghanistan. The person with our favorite answer to this week's question from hell wins your choice of whatever This Is Hell merchandise you want. The this is Hell t-shirt, the tote bag, the face covering or the face mask, our coffee mug, the This Is Hell guide to the 21st century flash drive, the winter hat, and everybody's favorite, the trucker's cap. People love that trucker's cap in white and in red. Or is it black? Who knows? I'm colorblind. You can see all of our merchandise at thisishell.com when you click on support, where you can contribute to completely listener-supported This Is Hell. Remember, without you, we got nothing, so thanks to all of you for your support. Brave enough to be streaming live, dumb enough to be goofy, stupid enough to think that we could be a regular part of your weekly hangover, This Is Hell, and Dan Hill, today's producer, has this week's hangover cure. Dan? This week's hangover cure is Red Ginseng. TheInsider.com ran a medically reviewed New Year's Eve story with the headline, The 10 Best Remedies to Cure a Hangover. According to The Insider, a 2014 study published in the journal Food and Function suggests that red ginseng may alleviate hangover symptoms. That study, Red Ginseng Relieves the Effects of Alcohol Consumption and Hangover Symptoms in Healthy Men, a randomized crossover study, states, Red ginseng shows positive effects on alcohol metabolism in animal studies. We investigated the effects of red ginseng on relieving alcohol and hangover symptoms in 25 healthy men in a randomized crossover study. Researcher, researchers found that considering the reduction of plasma alcohol levels, expert expiratory concentrations, and hangover severity, we conclude that red ginseng relieves the symptoms of alcohol hangover. That makes this week's hangover cure specifically Red ginseng. Is the uh, is implied in this whole study that they got animals drunk? Yeah, it sure seems like it. It's, it's kind of cruel. It happens. I think hedgehogs get tipsy 
Oh, really? Yeah, like stuff ferments in little burrows, and then they get all wasted. I, <laughs> I read that somewhere. Really? Yeah, they do. <laughs> i got to find out where you read that. Yeah, I gotta I'll know. send it your way. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, and in the past, we have offered ginseng as a possible hangover cure, but... Uh, to the best of my knowledge, and that's all we have to go on because who really wants to compile a list of the thousands of hangovers we've suggested here on This Is Hell? To the best of my knowledge, we have never specifically mentioned red ginseng, only ginseng more generally, for those of you who are keeping score at home, and I don't know why you would be. You can email us at chuck at com, and we will likely read your comments on air. You can also DM us via Twitter and message us via Facebook. Again, we will likely read those comments on air as well. Teresita, who has got in touch with us in the past, sent us a guest suggestion a while back, re- writing, requesting you interview someone from Degrowth Vienna later this spring. So I that's at degrowthvienna.org, and it's mostly in German, and uh, I sent that over to uh, Sebastian, who is a native German speaker, and maybe we'll find out more about Degrowth Vienna when Sebastian is producing later this week. Teresita also wrote, while, uh, while I was hospitalized and then recovering over the past couple of months, and she wrote, Chuck and crew, missing you. Hope all is well, better, or good. Looking forward to hearing you soon. I was nervous over you. I truly hope all is better and mending. Perhaps, if lucky, you we can see you this summer while drinking beer or with no beer. Beer and belly issues like yours aren't always a good mix, as I know. Please tell them to broadcast the anniversary party date. If This Is Hell is still planning on it, you guys have a lot to celebrate. Keep keeping on. Bueno, Teresita. So, Teresita and everybody else who is listening, the This Is Hell 26th Anniversary and Listener Appreciation Party takes place Saturday, September 17th, the final Saturday of summer, during summer's final weekend. That's Saturday, September 17th at Carrie's Lounge here in Chicago's West Ridge neighborhood, 2251 West Devon Avenue, directly downstairs from this here studio. And doors will be opening at that celebration at 3 p.m. There will be live music, food, a raffle, and the closing of the This Is Art art show upstairs here in the Second Story Studios, featuring art by listeners and suggested by listeners. This Is Art closes during our 26th anniversary party, but This Is Art opens during Carrie's Lounge 50-year celebration of being in business and a cornerstone of the neighborhood and community, which is all taking place on Saturday, July 23rd at Carrie's, again, 2251 West Devon Avenue, starting also at 3 p.m. Drop by for the opening of Carrie's 50 year, for, uh, at the opening for This Is Art at Carrie's 50-year celebration on July 23rd, and come over to the closing during our 26th anniversary party on September 17th. As for beer and how it goes with what you call belly issues, Teresita, yeah, carbonated beverages and Digestive problems do not mix. Doctors suggest those suffering from the intestinal problems that I have, that I, that we drink wine. Luckily, I am one quarter bohemian and one quarter German, and genetically I'm protected against any physical problems that are caused by beer. Okay, I'm actually Roma and Swiss, but who's counting? We also heard from Tove who has written to us also in the past, and has a suggestion and writes, Hi, Chuck and Alex and crew. It's so lovely to hear your voice with new interviews, Chuck. It's a joy, even though I'm uh, I'm at a bit of a low point right now. I'm writing with a a guest suggestion. Troy Vettis, V-T-T-E-S-E, and Drew Pendergrass have recently published a book entitled Half-Earth Socialism, A Plan to Save the Future from Extinction climate change, and pandemics. It's definitely a great source of inspiration for me, both for my master's thesis and otherwise, so I'm sure many of the listeners would enjoy hearing Choi and Drew talk. You can see more about the uh, project at half.earth and check out the Half Earth Socialism planning game they have there. Great thanks to you, Alex, and the rest of the board operators and producers for pulling the show through those hard chuckless times. All the best, Tove. First and most importantly, Tove, sorry to hear you at a low point right now. You have a lot of good reasons to be at a low point, and I have no idea what's going on with you personally, but you are absolutely correct, as right now pretty much sucks. Hopefully, you're feeling better, which I normally would not say, but when I was out sick, getting well wishes from others actually helped. 
Who knew? Because I had no idea that those kind of get well wishes actually made you feel better. Second, Tove, you're not the only one at a low point right now, and you are also not the only one suggesting we have the authors of Half-Earth Socialism on the show. Uh, I think both Alex and Sebastian have already suggested them as guests, and I believe that Alex has been getting and Sebastian has been receiving suggestions about Half-Earth Socialism through our Twitter account, at This Is Hell Radio. So we'll do what we can to have them on as the book sounds great. The publisher, Vert Verso, says in describing Half-Earth Socialism, we must humbly accept that humanity cannot fully understand or control the Earth, but we can plan new energy systems, large-scale rewilding and food production for the common good and i appreciate the heads up on the online game tove which we can be which can be found at play.half.earth while that game looks absolutely fascinating and a great great educational tool when it comes to how we should respond to climate change and what can be done about it i am far too amateur of a video game player and far too impatient of a human being to really get into it however If you are are adept at games like Civilization, this game is for you. Again, you can find it at play.half.earth. We'll have more of your emails following our guest. Coming up, Breaking Afghanistan and what can be done about it. We will also have This Week in Rotten History, some of your answers to this week's question from hell, and some more of your emails sent to us at chuck at thisishell.com. Live from late capitalism, where we know the value of everything. Sorry. Live from late capitalism, where we know the price of everything, but the value of nothing. This is hell. The United States and NATO broke Afghanistan after the Soviet Union broke Afghanistan. After foreign occupiers dating back centuries broke Afghanistan. And without that understanding, it is no surprise that the most recent foreign occupation, that of the United States and NATO, has been deemed by the occupiers as a failure. Here to help us have a better understanding of Afghanistan's past and present, and maybe even a glimpse into its future, political writer, political worker, writer, teacher, Asim Sajad Akhtar, wrote the Catalyst Journal article, Breaking Afghanistan. Welcome to This Is Hell, Asim. Thank you, Chuck, for having me. It's great to have you on the show. We had a lot of people contact us after I had announced on social media that you would be on the show, and they're very excited about hearing you. So thank you so much for being on the show. It truly is an honor. In the My pleasure. In the brief introduction to your writing, it states, the U.S. occupation of Afghanistan ended in a humiliating withdrawal, but its failure is wrongly explained by the media as resulting from the corruption of Afghan elites. To you... Why do you think the media wrongly explains the failure in Afghanistan on blaming the corruption of elites? What's why would they do that instead of having the more what I would call honest assessment as you give it? Well, frankly, because uh, to blame Afghan elites um, is is an easy cop out um, is uh, both ignores or deliberately neglects the fact that the, the very elites that Certainly, uh, there's no doubting, you know, got up and, and ran for the exit um, as soon as uh, it, looked, it was clear that, um, that, that they wouldn't be able to withstand the Taliban coming back. Um, but those first, those elites were propped up by the United States uh, for, for, the, for the best part of those 20 years. Uh, and more damningly, and of course, more the bigger reason why um, or the bigger sort of sort of aspect of this whole story, which the media refuses to perhaps is is uh, is, is is unwilling to or, or or sort of engages in self censorship about, is the fact that you have a monstrous uh, imperial military industrial complex in which the media itself is party, uh, which makes money from from wars, and Afghanistan was no exception, and and uh, there's enough. Um, documentation of how much money was made by military contractors by you know who were given contracts by the pentagon uh and how the the, the you know the 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 whole war making expedition from from its outset was the flames were fanned by the media um so so why would they in a sense implicate themselves in that sense it makes perfect it is perfectly logical that they would choose to to highlight a different explanation 
So why is the U.S. so bad at picking the correct elites to support in any war on terror? <laughs> or isn't it not about uh, supporting the correct elites? It's about supporting elites in general. Exactly. Yes. So there, I, I, you know, the, the very word failure is, of course, to be, I think, taken um, sort of with a bit of, a, you know, to sort of contextualize failure when we look at it perhaps from the people of Afghanistan, failure when we look at it from the perspective of what was projected around the world about the war on terror, that the world's going to become more peaceful and, you know, these these so-called enemies of civilization are going to be neutered and, and we're going to defeat them. And so none of that happened. And none of that was ever going to happen, though, um, because that was never the plan. And in fact, when Biden withdrew, um, you'll remember sort of sheepishly um, him as him sort of explaining the situation by saying, well, we never really had a nation building project in Afghanistan. Um, that's not what we were there to do. But, but in fact, successive regimes from George W. Bush onwards made those sorts of claims. Um, so failure in a sense, because the, the, you know, the, the captive audience, the world audience that, that, you know, whether we're duped into believing this or, you know, perhaps, um, you know, many of us knew that this was never the case, but, but our voices, of course, are drowned out by the corporate media, um, but not failure from the perspective of the, you know, as I said, the war making uh, machine that is American empire. You also point out that on August 29th, 2021, the longest war in U.S. history culminated in an American drone strike killing 10 members of a single family in Kabul after making, quote-unquote, peace with and meekly handing Afghanistan back to the same Taliban against whom the so-called war on terror was waged for 20 years. Washington now claimed that the clandestine militant group known as the Islamic State was active on Afghan soil. The closing act of the war in Afghanistan then was a microcosm of so many that preceded it. A depraved empire dropping bombs on hapless civilians under the guise of neutering a nebulous threat to United States national security. Why do you view the Islamic State as a nebulous, that is an unclear, vague, or ill-defined threat? Why is either the Islamic State or the Taliban not a real national security threat to the United States, in your opinion? Well, I mean... Like for that, I think, you know, the, the longer explanation requires us to think about the very idea or ideology of national security, um, which precedes just the war on terror conjuncture. It, you can, you know, you, you go all the way back to dropping atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, you can go further back. So, so, A, there's a whole question of national security and, and what that actually signifies and, and how it's deployed uh, to, to in fact, justify, um, uh, you know, very cynical strategic interests. But let's say more specifically, your question about the Islamic State, your, some of your listeners may remember if they're, if, if they were around and, and con politically conscious when the war in Afghanistan began, um, the Taliban weren't actually as such directly sort of the target, at least not in, in George W. Bush's rhetoric at the time. The Taliban were, were, were bombed, or Afghanistan was bombed, or the Taliban regime was, in a sense, was displaced by the American invading force uh, on the pretext that it was sheltering Al-Qaeda. Do you remember Al-Qaeda? Does anybody remember Al-Qaeda? Um, that, you know, um, worldwide sort of force that was apparently going to make um, the world impossible to, for us all civilized people to live in. Uh, that's what I mean by nebulous. Where did Al-Qaeda go? And, and when did Islamic State suddenly emerge to take its place? And for people like us living in, in the non-Western world or in Muslim countries, um, and when we look at Syria, or we look at Libya, or we look at even in Iraq, or we look at um, Yemen, uh, the United States, it's not even like um, sort of camouflaging or secretively, it's pretty much openly supporting entities like the Islamic State in those parts of the world. So when I say nebulous, it's because the whole pretext that somehow, oh, now there's something new on the scene that, that we have to come and defend the world against. I mean, we've heard this so many times before, and there's been so many 
sites and, and places and spaces around the world that have been brutalized under the pretext that this is both a threat to the US and a threat to the world. And so this for me uh, and for many like myself, I think um, sounds, um, you know, just more or less like the same old hogwash that we've heard so many times before. But we do hear the media reporting on, you know, a new Al Qaeda branch popping up in the uh, in Yemen or in uh, Western Africa or wherever. You constantly hear the media saying Al Qaeda in blank has emerged. So you were saying, where has Al Qaeda gone? Is that kind of labeling of these groups uh, as Al Qaeda affiliated groups? Is that just a matter of those groups' personal branding in order to, uh, you know, send some sort of message to the United States and the West? I mean, I I, I wish I I could say I was familiar enough with with the sort of internal dynamics of uh, religious militant groups like. Whether whether we you know the name be Al Qaeda or the name be Islamic State or and you, and you know that there's many different um, factions of within some of these groups. The Taliban itself, as I write in this article itself, is far from a coherent entity um, that that has no internal um, divisions. So I can't I I won't claim to speak about you know any particular sort of you know report or and you know. Who is this and who is it not? I'm just simply saying that for me, and, and mind you, the country in which I live, Pakistan, has has you know has a has has now a pretty long drawn out history with religious militancy as well. We have our own version of the Taliban. It's called the the Pakistani Taliban as opposed to the Afghan Taliban. We have all number of um, groups that name themselves all sorts of things. There's groups that go by the name the Mujahideen, which of course was the original name for the militants that were U.S. backed against um, uh, the Soviet army in the 1980s. So I'm, my, my, what I'm trying to say is that, in a sense, we don't know very much about these groups. We know that certainly they are reactionary, they, are, they use violence, they are extremely uh, conservative and you know, there's there's not much there's not much of a silver lining about any of these militant groups, um, but in a sense, we people like ourselves in regions like this are stuck between the devil and the deep blue sea, right? This is on the one hand, there's the world's most powerful empire, um, which goes to war when it wants under whatever justification it, it devises, and on the other hand, we have purportedly its enemies on the other side, which against whom it's going to war, also who are just, well, just at least at the smaller scale because they're just not as powerful, but are as prone to engage in violence and brutality against ordinary civilian populations. And, and I guess what I want to be able to say is that 20 years of bloodletting in Afghanistan didn't change that equation. In fact, it just, we just, we are caught back at square one. And for me then, the fundamental responsibility for that cycle or that in a sense sort of never ending cycle is as, as I said earlier with the most powerful military uh, power in the world. You also point out that for the best part of two decades the much trumpeted gains of the American occupation were concentrated in urban areas while millions of Afghans in the countryside suffered indiscriminate bombings and ground raids. Why was controlling cities not successful in the United States and NATO attempts at undermining the power of the Taliban? Why does controlling cities not control Afghanistan? After all, that's where all of the money and power and people are, isn't it? Well, I mean, it's it's uh, it there as as you noted with the with the quote from Marx. It's it's where most of the money and the people are concentrated. Um, but just for some, uh, you know, some some basic information, Afghanistan uh, is a is approximately, and it's hard to know for sure, but there's anywhere between 38 and 40 million people in Afghanistan. Um, six or so million of those of that of that total is it's is concentrated in in one city, Kabul. Um, if you add other big cities like Herat or Mazar e Sharif or Jalalabad. Um, you know, you'll, they'll, you'll probably take that population up to almost half. Um, but that still leaves half of the population 
um, in rural and, and peri-urban areas. Um, and and this the, the, what 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 the occupation did was um, and and this is sort of as you noted yourself in introducing the article, uh, this is a repetitive theme in Afghanistan's history um, that um, in a sense uh, occupying forces or those who seek to prop up uh, regimes which struggle to domestic regimes as as we started off talking about like the, those local elites um, who who do not have a claim to legitimacy over the entire country. Um, they focus all of their energies on these cities. Um, and they, in a sense, um, try to create some kind of um, both physical infrastructure and administrative infrastructure within the urban space uh, to compensate for the fact that um, both in the 1980s uh, and then in the 1990s, after uh, when, the, when the Taliban first came to power, and then again, after 2001, when the Americans were, were sitting in Afghanistan, um, the rural areas ended up basically becoming a lightning rod for rebellion and insurgency. So you have the city, uh, concentration of wealth, power, uh, occupying force, um, and then the rest of the, the population, well, and then the rest of the country uh, essentially largely deprived of any systematic um, infrastructural development or any kind of functioning civilian or policing apparatus largely left uh, uh, to the hands of the insurgents. And so this is a model that cannot work. It's a model that is designed to fail in a sense because how long, I mean, or at the very least you can have a never ending low intensity insurgency persisting with its base in rural areas. So. This is, um, and that's, our, that's partly the irony of history that I'm drawing out in this article, which is to say, well, we, they already knew that this would happen to the Soviet Union, but they didn't, they in fact did a much worse job. I mean, the Soviet Union and its occupying force and, and all of that is something we need not get into at length, but uh, it's, it's, the irony is that at that time, it was the rural insurgents were the Mujahideen and they were American backed. And you know, and, and the same thing then, you know, in this, the, the, the page of history turns and the same thing is being reproduced with the Americans now in the cities propping up a weak and illegitimate regime. And, and, and as we said earlier, whether this was failure because um, they didn't know what to expect or failure by design is, of course, I, I leave it up to your, your listeners to, to reach their own conclusions. So just more generally, I couldn't help but think about this, and, and I'm not just speaking about Afghanistan specifically, but we're seeing this urban-rural divide here in the United States. We're seeing it in places like India. Is this an outcome, do you think? Is this exacerbated by neoliberalism and globalization? Is this something that's becoming a more and more global ph phenomenon as we become a more globalized world? Yeah, no, I mean, that's a great question. And I, I um, obviously in this article, I don't really engage very much in any comparison beyond Afghanistan. It's difficult to compare Afghanistan with, with, with countries that have not been devastated by a perpetual war. Um, so the other examples like in, in America or in India or, or other um, countries are obviously have not been their, their entire, you know, societies and political Economies have not been overshadowed by overdetermined by war, but there is there is a certain starkness to and and and, uh, and sort of a clear divide again between town and country. Um, and I know that you know from what I understand um, about you know the rise of Trump, or if, if, if you look at the rise of, of Modi in India, or you know other similar sorts of forms of reactionary politics, they they thrive on this inequality and they, they play it up and they claim to be speaking for the underdog and the person who's been left behind. When in fact, of course, they're absolutely not and they're just taking us for a ride. But, but as you say correctly, it's because the neoliberal mainstream um, or what the, the, the British Pakistani writer Tariq Ali calls the extreme center, you know, these centrists who, who claim to be like these great upholders of, of liberal principles. Um, but have presided over a period, as, as you rightfully note, called neoliberalism, where inequality has skyrocketed, um, you know, and um, oligarchs have made buttloads of money all over the world, outsourcing and offshoring. And in that process, 
um, as you're saying, including other forms of inequality, but one of the big, um, no, both most noticeable phenomena is that, that uh, again, concentration of wealth, pleasure, needs, entertainment, fetishes of various kinds of, of, of commodities, all concentrated in urban areas. And, and even, you know, those left behind in rural areas are flocking to cities, migrating. And even when they get to cities, they're hidden away in, in slums and squatter settlements. So even in cities, you see like, like this, this very acute divide. And these divides are, are, are certainly, I think, um, are crucial to, 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 to take note of and, 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 and more so to understand uh, how, how these are being taken advantage of by, by reactionaries. And they can be reactionaries like the Taliban or the right wing religious right of the kinds that exist in Afghanistan, or they can be other forms of, of populace. Asim just mentioned a past guest on our show, Tariq Ali, who uh, called it, as you were saying, the extreme center. And we are working right now to have Tariq back on the show. He has a new biography out that is uh, of Winston Churchill that is incredibly critical of Churchill, which is something that we definitely need. We are speaking with Asim Sajad Akhtar, who wrote the Catalyst Journal article, Breaking Afghanistan. So you point out that the occupation exacerbated major social fault lines of class, geography, gender, and ethnicity in Afghanistan, thus creating the conditions for the Taliban to retake power. So uh, do wars always exacerbate social fault lines? Is that why the war on terror, the so-called war on terror failed? Because social fault lines that are already fragile, if not stretched to their you know limit, broke? Yeah, I mean, I think if, if one has to come up with some kind of general um, appraisal of how things like, you know, how, how major wars in history, what they have done, they certainly, they push society to the brink. Um, they may um, exacerbate or deepen what is already happening. Uh, they may sort of trigger sort of, uh, you know, other kinds of, extreme forms of polarization um but uh, you know that's the nature of war because it, as as for instance in afghanistan if you if you're if you're creating this um island of prosperity in kabul where like development workers are coming in and consultants are coming in and and you have like you know five star hotels being built and all sorts of facilities but at the same time in the same country and maybe just uh, you know, a couple of hundred kilometers away, um, you know, like the hundred pound bombs are, are pummeling uh, innocent people into, into well, killing most of them and then leaving the rest maimed and, and so on and so forth. So um, that certainly is going to create a geographical division between, you know, that, that, that the island of prosperity versus the pockets of, of, of devastation around it. Um, in Afghanistan's case, this also happened, and there's again a long history to this. Uh, in sort of, there's a long history of polarization of, uh, in terms of ethnicity. So uh, Afghanistan, or what we call the modern Afghan state, um, is comprised of different ethnic groups, including Pashtuns, including Tajiks, Hazaras, Uzbeks, um, and they, and and certainly the American occupation didn't do very much to to sort of uh, redress those those that ethnic divide um, and it, other divides as well gender became a very heavily politicized thing both leading up to the invasion of Afghanistan you might again your your, your your listeners might remember that that was one of the major ideological sort of claims made by the Bush administration that Afghan women are really seriously in need of our help um, because of this brutal fascist Taliban regime sheltering Al Qaeda and 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 treating women like crap, uh, you know. Uh, on top of that, so and, and th those in in same thing happened in that case, right? There there are some women who got access, girls who got access to education, those who were in Kabul or in other big cities, but the vast majority of of young girls and women were left high and dry, and 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 so. You know, in, inevitably, I think war is, is because it's uneven, because it, it, there's always supporters of war versus the victims of war, even in, in any given country. Um, you will always, I think, see to some extent or another 
um, existing forms of polarization just just shoot through the roof. You were mentioning the history of Afghanistan. To what extent has Afghanistan been a single United Nation since the beginning of modern Afghanistan in 1926, following the end of foreign domination of the area? Is Afghanistan's biggest challenge that there is no real Afghanistan? Um, I mean, I think that we, I, I certainly think, you, yes, I mean, that's a big challenge, um, you know, in such a, uh, a war ravaged country to, to, to maintain um, or just to, to establish and then maintain an idea or a shared sense of, of nationhood and, and, and to also have then the, the material infrastructures necessary to, to sustain that, that, that nation state. Um, you know, are are inevitably a challenge, uh, especially after the um, what what twenty years of of uh, American occupation has, has left Afghanistan further away from being able to do that. But I mean, to suggest that it's not, uh, or I mean, not saying you suggesting that, but in some in terms of the way you frame the question, that it isn't even could be considered can be even considered a, a coherent nation state. I think we can. I think that. In a sense, the problem is precisely the fact that Afghan, Afghanistan's people um, have not been, um, in a sense, allowed to, empowered to, left to their own devices to, to sort themselves out. And, you know, whether it be the Americans, whether it be if my countries, especially military establishment, of course, uh, pro, one of the major protégés of the Pentagon, uh, you know, living and, and acting in its image for the best part of 75 years. You know, the Pakistani military has repeatedly intervened in Afghanistan, repeatedly, um, you know, uh, exacerbated. We've talked about these, these divides of various kinds. Um, so I don't think that it's an impossibility for Afghanistan to, to be. Uh, and, and, you know, maybe, again, this is even before my time, but I... I, I know that in the Muslim world, um, you know, there were two cities and two sort of, in a sense, melting pots that, that were, were, were considered to be very modern and, and there's lots of cultural life. And, and they were Kabul and Beirut in the 1970s before both of those cities and both of those countries, Afghanistan and Lebanon, were, were just reduced to rubble and, and are still suffering 50 years later. Um, so it's not like that can't happen in Afghanistan. Or there's no history of, you know, some kind of vibrant political project that brings, okay, if not everyone, then significant numbers of Afghanistan's people together uh, around some shared ideals and, 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 you know, whether they be economic or political or cultural. Um, and, and, of course, when, when you don't allow those forces uh you know social forces or indigenous forces to to acknowledge their conflict i mean let's not romanticize anything They're, these are these are also conflicts that that are not purely produced by foreign intervention but uh you know all societies have internal conflicts and the real question is do do any or which why are only some societies deemed incapable of resolving it themselves and become uh, battlegrounds of of, uh, of of other countries. And Afghanistan, of course, is 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 uh, one of the most prominent examples of that tragedy. You also write that for the first two years or so after the U.S. invasion, there was little unrest in large parts of rural Afghanistan, with Taliban cadres either in hiding or having retreated to safe havens within Pakistan. War hysteria in the United States and the rest of the so-called free world, however, had to be sustained as indiscriminate raids on civilian populations, drone attacks, and other facets of air war intensified, and insurgency was reborn, and individuals and families who had no love lost for the Taliban were driven into their rehabilitated ranks. Why did war hysteria, hysteria as you call it, need to be sustained? How does indiscriminate aerial bombing in Afghanistan sustain war hysteria back in the United States? Because I think this is something that people here in the U.S. don't recognize. Well, I mean, if, if you'll allow me, I'll, I'll sort of just um, skip over to the other big site of the, of the war on terror, which was Iraq. And, and I think this is something that might bring this into, into sharper focus. Um, we all know that uh, 
the, the, the war in Iraq started barely, not even 18 months after the war in Afghanistan was initiated. And for a long time, in fact, Iraq overshadowed Afghanistan. Um, and one of the reasons for that was because a hue and cry was generated by the Bush administration uh, about, if you will recall, the term was weapons of mass destruction. Um, and, you know, all sorts of, of propaganda and, and just, just, you know, so-called uh, apparently, because of course we were never shown it. I mean, I mean, both Americans and, and the rest of the world's people um, evidence, but we were, we were told that there's just simply no doubt and we know and we have intelligence and we have information that they have weapons of mass destruction and Saddam Hussein is going to do God knows what and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, now we know, in fact, soon after um, Iraq was invaded and Saddam was, 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 uh, was killed or whatever, or displaced and, and, and uh, you know, a pro-American regime was installed, that there were never any weapons of mass destruction or nothing of the magnitude that the Bush administration had claimed um, necessitated that war, right? Because the whole pre the whole uh, the whole sort of in some sense the pretext of going into Iraq was that if we don't go in, it was preemptive, right? If we don't go in, then Saddam is going to deploy these WMDs and that will be the end of us. So. You know that is a that is essentially um, the kind of hysteria that I'm referring to, um, and so it's not just about Afghanistan. It, it was the hysteria that that was that that defined the early years of the, of the so-called war on terror. Uh, you know where you had tropes like threats to civilization, um, and you know if we don't preempt, then then God knows what will happen. And mind you, you know in Pakistan um, at the time similar sorts of um, widespread propaganda campaigns uh, were undertaken, uh, you know, so each, I think each country or state that bought in to this logic of the war on terror essentially mimicked what the United States was doing at a global level, um, which was to scare its own civilian populations into basically becoming unconditional supporters of anything that took place under the guise of some kind of, of this notion of this threat of terror out there somewhere. We might not know about it, but we trust that our governments are going to protect us. And that um, is, is essentially, is hysteria. It's, it's, it's how you generate hysteria. Um, and post facto, um, we know now that, that uh, there was nothing that these, Afghanistan in particular, like what, uh, as, as you just, uh, you know, the quote that you just reflected, in fact, the Taliban, had had fragmented, you know, that Taliban, the Taliban that had ruled Afghanistan up till 2001. Um, and, you know, of course, we don't have a counterfactual in history, but who's to say if, if um, uh, and that's why I start off with saying, I mean, is this failure by design or is this failure, you know, I mean, it, it, is it an innocent failure? Because the, the fact of, the fact of just incessant bombing and, and was actually the trigger for a re, uh, you know, in a sense, um, re, a, a, a deepening, or at least first of all, so, uh, taking root, and then a deepening of this very, um, very acute sense of like, why are they killing us? Why are they bombing us? What, what, like, what are we? How are we threatening them? And and that's why I started this interview by noting. Um, and then I have all sorts of statistics for your readers to check out when you, if you read the article, that making war itself is an enterprise, you know, and, and that, that for me, honestly speaking, I can't come up with any other explanation for why you would go in and, and have these indiscriminate raids when there's no one out there who's, who's, who's about to, you know, represent a threat to you, except that you want your contractors to make a lot of money and, and you want, your, your big munitions companies to continue pumping profits um, because, you know, they're without war, how will war making companies make money? And to you then, is that what explains why the United States, NATO, other Western entities did not realize the impact aerial bombings would have on the rural population, not only in turning the, uh, those in rural areas to support the Taliban, but also in forcing those in the countryside to seek safe sh shelter in cities, which then became unsustainable it is because it seems pretty predictable that this would happen in yeah. hindsight so yeah. it, it, yes okay 
Yeah, absolutely. You're right. I mean, it is. It's one, one sort of shakes one head and says, look, I could have figured this out, right? And I'm a lay person. That if you, if you have, you know, if you sort of pound people into oblivion, then, then that's sort of going to, it's definitely not the winning hearts and minds part of the, of the story playing out. That, of course, again, successive, whether it be American presidents or, or you know, again, even individual states waging these so-called anti-terrorist wars have, have, have claimed to want to do. Um, and, and, you know, as a student of history, that's why I'm less likely to be sort of just allow for that innocent failure explanation. I think empires do this by design. They, they may make ideological claims that they're going to want to win hearts and minds. But, you know, in fact, as I said, Biden let the cat out of the bag at the time of withdrawal, he's like, well, we never really wanted to do anything. You know, we didn't have any plans to build a nation or to rehabilitate that nation. Um, could he have been just licking his wounds and, and, and sort of covering up for, as you say, um, their, their blind spots? And their, and I don't know. I, I don't know enough. For me, enough, enough about the inside story. But for me, when I look at you know, and this is a region, mind you, in Afghanistan where you can trace it back to the to what was called the great game between the British and Russian empires. And and it was cynical then. Um, there was violence deployed indiscriminately then. Um, there were, you know, carrot and stick policies then as well. And and I see, you know, of course, not exactly in the same way as, as in the 18th, 19th century, but there are some starkly similar sort of patterns to how big powers operate then and as they operate now. And, and that's why, for me, it feels like, um, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll always inevitably, when, when some state, whether it's mine or yours or anybody else's, makes a claim that I'm doing this for national security, I'm doing this to save the world, I'm doing this to make the world peaceful, I will always be... Um, sort of skeptical and I'll always demand um, ev information, evidence, uh, explanation, why you think that this is going to solve this deep conflict, this political conflict, this inter-ethnic conflict, this class conflict, how is going to bomb one, bombing one side or, 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 you know, sort of sheltering another side, uh, how is this going to help? And I don't think there are ever any military solutions for, for political conflicts. And that also just reminds me of the war on drugs and how that is kind of a, a conflict that we're trying to solve all over the world or use that as a reason as to a national security threat to the you know individuals within a country. And I just want to make this point about how uh, the Soviet Union had very much, the Soviet Union-backed government within Afghanistan had very much the same strategy that the United States-backed government in Afghanistan had, and that is uh, centering its focus on the towns and then ignoring the countryside. And you write, by 1984, a bona fide class of warlords had been created from among the Mujahideen, facilitated by the Pakistani military-controlled national logistics cell, with the latter transporting heroin from Afghanistan through Peshawar down to the port city of Karachi, to, for export to Western markets. In 1986, heroin produced in Afghanistan and Pakistan uh, accounted for almost a third of the global drug smuggling industry's total value of 100 billion U.S. dollars. The similarities of the Afghan to the Latin American theater of the Cold War were striking to take but one notorious case. CIA-backed Contra rebels bled the Sandinista revolution in Nicar Nicaragua through funds uh, generated in the production and trade of cocaine. And then you point out that uh, from 2016 onward, poppy production, officially banned during the Taliban's first stint in power, boomed in Helmand province, confirming the futility of heavily funded anti-narcotics campaigns conducted by the occupying force. According to the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, by 2012, Afghanistan accounted for more than 80 percent of global opiate production. So is it, it uh, was winning the Cold War or winning the war on drugs simply or, uh, or winning the war on terror simply not or more important than winning the war on drugs did we prioritize the cold war did we prioritize the war on terror over the war on drugs to the expense of drug eradication 
Well, again, you know, I, I, I'll take a, I mean, I hear your question. I'll, I'll try and answer it by sort of bringing both these points together. I don't think that it was either or. I don't think that it needed to be either or. I think it was, as, 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 the, as the sort of um, passages you read out from the text confirm, more like drugs were a source of revenue deliberately cultivated by, you know, you know, either side of the Cold War, in this case, the Americans in Afghanistan or in Nicaragua. Um, um, and, and in fact, a lot of these, you know, you'll know, maybe your readers will or will not know, but in the 1980s, when the Mujahideen were being backed by Washington against the Soviet army in Afghanistan, the, the, it, it couldn't actually happen through formal Congress funding. And there's, there's all sorts of technical explanations for that, which I won't get into. So there were, so in a sense, the fact that you were autonomously created sources for which, I mean, it's the irony, and I'll explain this irony. You, you, you know, again, you'll see in popular culture and Hollywood movies that the, the, the gun that became very widespread used in Afghanistan in the 1980s is called the Kalashnikov. Now, you, even if you don't know, um, much about that history, you, you, you can listen to, the, to that word and have a sense. This is a Russian gun, or, or at the time, a Soviet-made gun. So the irony of the fact that a Kalashnikov was in the hands of Mujahideen fighting the Soviet army, and this is all because of the circulation of drug money, of various other forms of contraband profits, and this doesn't happen just by chance, right? It cannot happen when, on the one hand, you are, you, you are, as you say, claiming simultaneously to be fighting some kind of epic war against narcotics and narcotic trade, narcotics trade, and, 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 and then you, you find like mass amounts of money being made from narcotics and then also going into the munitions industries. Um, so for me, the, again, this is a case of, I, I am more skeptical than to, except the explanation that, well, we wanted to fight the war on drugs and also fight these terrorists, but, you know, it was hard for us to do both or we couldn't really, and, you know, we sort of, you know, made some mistakes, but they were honest and innocent mistakes. No, none of this is honest or innocent for me. This is all, again, part of, again, if I put it into historical context, um, for, for some of your listeners, this is slightly, might not be a great analogy, but the British Empire, um, back in the day, in the mid-19th century, um, actually deliberately pumped opium into Chinese markets. That wasn't a mistake. Empires don't do mistakes like this. You know, there was something called the Opium War, where literally they forced Chinese markets to open up for supply of opium, coming in, in fact, from this region, from the subcontinent and from Afghanistan. Um, and uh, so as, in fact, to achieve their own strategic interests, which is to to basically, um, you know, so to, 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 to flood, uh, you know, Chinese markets with opium and, and create essentially a drug problem there. And so none of this, I think, is, is innocent or, but, or, or just happens because, you know, strategies failed. Or stra I think there's a strategic design that, that facilitates um, situations like this in Afghanistan. Um, and, you know, in a sense, uh, that's precisely what I'm calling attention to, that we need to, to situate in historical context. And, and then only then is there a chance or is there a hope that we will emerge from these, in a sense, very repetitive cycles of brutalization and money making and, of course, um, all sorts of violence. So you also point out that it is more than a little ironic that slogans of women's empowerment were such a central plank of the American occupation. The generation of young Afghan girls and women who have come to age under the war on terror regime have unsurprisingly imbibed liberal notions of individual liberty with some experiencing upward class mobility through the NGO or corporate sectors. This is why many are now lamenting their betrayal at the hands of the United States and Western governments more generally. So I've only got a few more questions for you, but I want to ask about what could have or what could be done. What could have the U.S. and the West done to not be seen as betraying Afghan women? Well, I mean, I think in that sense, the answer is pretty simple, not leaving them in the lurch. Um, because, you know, 20 years, as we've talked about, and especially in, in the cities, 
creating an infrastructure, making especially women and girls feel like they can come out, they can go to school, they can play music, they can just be like little boys and, and young men, you know, have the luxury, which it is a luxury really, in places like Afghanistan, even in Pakistan, uh, for for girls and women to be out walking the streets and to 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 be able to 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 in a sense take for granted that they that they can enjoy public space and and, and enjoy basic liberties. And I think when you know, as as I as I've noted in the article, when some Afghan women, not all, of course, importantly, but some had that opportunity, um, some of them literally came of age, right? I mean, um, they were might have been very young. Some were born during the occupation, and twenty years is, is a significant, it's like a generation. And and if a, and you know, when if you're two or three years old in two thousand and one, and by two thousand and twenty two, um, you you know you're you're a young adult. And so you've really imbibed this feeling and these, you know, you start to take for granted again, these liberties, and all of a sudden they're taken away. And not just taken away in any kind of like, oh, okay, just go and sit at home, but taken away where literally, you know, the, 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 the very right to life is threatened. Uh, the right to go to school is no longer, you know, it's just taken from you. And so that is what this, that, that feeling of betrayal, betrayal is a, is a word that, that became after August 2021, became very, you know, a popular currency amongst young Afghans. And I understand that, you know, um, because they believed that this was, they were, that, that they were going to get a long-term commitment to democracy from, you know, with American support. They believed that their society was, was not going to, again, go back to one which women were forced to veil or couldn't even go to school. Um, and... They couldn't see what was coming, and I don't blame them because why should they be able to see what's coming? And why they they can't see what cynical or strategic games are taking place in Doha when the U.S. is signing Afghanistan back into the Taliban's hands necessarily? So I think really, um, what could they have done? I don't know. I mean, they, that would be a long story. That would require us to go back to the beginning of the story and and, and do it all very differently. Um, but once the U.S. had invaded and occupied and, and created these hopes and expectations, I think this feeling of betrayal was inevitable whenever the U.S. was going to leave, especially given how it did leave. And, 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 and as we start stated, that stated right at the outset, those who it left behind in its wake, the Ghani government, didn't, simply did not have uh, one leg to stand on and collapsed even before the Americans had left the scene. Just two more questions for you, Asim, I promise. You uh, conclude by writing, left progressives across the region, not to mention Western metropolitan contexts, must equip themselves to understand the highly uneven Afghan social formation, as well as the political economic logics, including trade and contraband, oil and gas and mineral exploration, that uh, underlie both geopolitical games and Afghanistan's fragmented structure of power. Only then can a hateful identity politics be displaced by a meaningful popular alternative to wage the struggle for a genuine and lasting peace in Afghanistan and the region at large. So is identity politics at the heart of the ongoing conflict within Afghanistan, whether that's the identity politics of the Taliban or those supported by the U.S. and NATO? Yeah, I mean, identity politics, I don't want to open up a can of worms here because I, I, I imagine this is a raging debate um, within uh, you know, for has been for a long time. I, I'm privy to some of those debates, in America included. Um, but the, the specific term I use was hateful, right? So in the, I'm referring specifically to, of course, the Taliban or, to, you know, religious uh, motifs and, and the religious right uh, specifically, because it is the dominant political, in a sense, um, uh, force in Afghanistan, right? Of course, they run the government and. And then, as we talked about the different points in the interview, there's others, some possibly in conflict with even the Taliban, like the Islamic State, and God knows how many others there may be, or even, as I've written in the article, that, that, these, that these various brands of the religious right are also themselves, like the Taliban itself is divided in different factions. So what I'm trying to ask progressives to consider is, look, we can't wish them to go away. They have established 
themselves by hook or by crook or sometimes even by making claims that they were the only ones around to fight the occupying force. Um, and, and if we want something else, if we want a politics that speaks in, in a different language and that is not so exclusionary, uh, and yet we also want not for the Americans or for some other you know, Western power to come in under the guise of you know, saving, the, saving Afghan women and so on and so forth, um, then how do we do that? And that's, that's sort of the question I'm posing, right? In, in the article throughout, but also at the end. And I think what I'm, the answer is simple, that we, that we can't just do it by, by wishful thinking, or we can't just do it by saying, oh, our ideas are better, or you know, we, we really care about the people. No, I mean, that's, that's not enough. Um, we have to recognize things like, as we talked about through this, through this interview, that ordinary Afghans are implicated for their own livelihood needs, are implicated in things like drug production. Um, you know, ordinary Afghans, some of them are the foot soldiers of the I, I wrote about how some became perhaps, uh, you know, in a sense, were driven into Taliban ranks despite not even actually abhorring, despite abhorring the Taliban. Um, you know, that can be sometimes, you know, because you were themselves under the threat of coercion, that can be because, you know, as, as a militant, you, you earn a pittance and you maybe support your family. I mean, these are brutalized societies, the kinds of alternatives available to people, ordinary people are not determined or dictated purely by some, you know, unadulterated set of ideas, which people either like or dislike. It's, it's, it's probably much more complicated than that. And until progressives think about these questions and, and then also make themselves available um, and, and, and to people and, and stand with people and say, okay, well, you, you, you can have the courage to defy the Taliban. Um, uh, I, not to say that that's easy or that will happen overnight or that, that you know, even the geopolitics of, of the region has changed. In fact, it hasn't. Uh, so, so you can't really also expect rely on any kind of meaningful support from some pro-people state around you. But I, unfortunately, there's no shortcut. And that's why um, I've written this article for, for, you know, for you guys on, on that side of the world, but even for us on this side of the world to take stock of how we, what role we have to play to, to sort of extricate ordinary people from this, as I said, between the, between the devil and the deep blue sea. We ha I got one last question for you. We have been speaking with Asim Sajad Akhtar, who wrote the Catalyst article, Breaking Afghanistan. And despite our conversation right now going on for over 50 minutes, we, again, have just skimmed the surface of the intense depth of Asim's writing. And everybody who is listening should definitely go to the Catalyst website and check out the article. Again, Asim Sajad Akhtar wrote the article, Breaking Afghanistan. And you can follow Asim on Twitter at Asim Sajad, followed by the letter A. One last question for you, Asim. And as we do with all of our guests, our final question is what we call the question from hell, the question we hate to ask, you may hate to answer, or our audience is going to hate your response. Uh, what do you think the United States or any country that dedicates a holiday to remembering military service members, as we did this last weekend, military service members who lost their lives, what do they miss in their understanding of, of a war of, or of war in general when that Memorial Day, as it's known here in the United States, does not remember the civilians who died who far outnumber those in the military who die in each and every war? How does a Memorial Day for military members who died in war while not remembering the civilian deaths affect the way we view and understand war? Well, I mean, I think quite simply, it just it just reinforces that feeling, which um, which you know, the other, the the proverbial other, uh, which uh, you know, once upon a time, I remember even in the late nineteen nineties, the experiences with myself in America, there was always this question: Why do they hate us? And that's sort of a you know, it's a sort of a rhetorical question because I think that that if you do, as you say, scratch beneath the surface and you think about you know, rituals like this, where you have these, you know, remembrances and memorials, and it's all fine and well, because people who die should be uh, commemorated. But as you rightfully note, all people who die, not just some, not just those who wear a uniform, or even in, in even more specifically, those who wear a particular kind of uniform, because, you know, in, 
wars, there are all types of people who are who are fighting and dying. And, and for me, they are all foot soldiers. So I, I certainly have no problem with anyone commemorating their soldiers. Um, but as you say, for me, the the life of, of any particular soldier, whether it be an American soldier or a Pakistani soldier, is is certainly not more valuable than the life of any ordinary civilian. Um, and in Afghanistan, more civilians died. And in every war, in fact, generally speaking, around the world in history, uh, it is largely civilians who bear the brunt. And and if and if we neglect to name them, even if we can't, if we if they've died and they're they're gone from this earth, okay. But at the very least, we can name them and acknowledge them. If we don't, then we certainly are are asking, or we're not. We're certainly not reducing our chances of you know people associated with the people who died whether they were personally associated or even people you know who 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 ask why did this civilian why did these civilians have to die what was what was their death for why why were they bombed why were they made fodder for 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 uh, corporate profits or military interests or strategic interests or some so-called notion of national security because there will always be people who ask that question, and it is those people who ask those sorts of questions, I think, that keep um, our societies uh, living and, and don't they, and, and give us some hope that we can come out of this slumber that is generated by wars and capitalism. Um, and you know, even if the, the people who have these commemorative services don't ask, we will continue to ask, and maybe one day. They will see the, the 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 reasons why we ask those questions. Even if they don't, we will continue to ask. On that incredibly hopeful note, Asim, I truly appreciate you being on the show. This really is an honor and a pleasure. And I have your email address, so I'm going to be annoying you in the future to come back on the show. I really appreciate you being on today. By all, my pleasure, Chuck. And thank you to to yourself, to your team, and to your listeners. Uh, it was my pleasure. All right, take care. Your eyewitness to grief, this is hell of what you just heard from Asim on the breaking of Afghanistan by the West. That conversation was in some way enlightening or deprogrammed you from previously held beliefs or understandings or made you feel like you actually learned something or to realize that, yes, this really is hell. Show your support by becoming a subscriber to our weekly bonus Patreon podcast, which this week streams live on Friday at 10 a.m. Chicago time. This podcast shortly after it. Patreon.com slash this is hell. Patreon, P A T R E O N.com slash this is hell. And you can also show your support for completely listener supported this is hell by visiting this is hell.com and clicking on support where you can see all the ways you can support this is hell. On last week's Patreon podcast, I reported on my transition from being detained in a hospital where I did two weeks' time bedridden for a total of over a month, including at home, I'm in a transition back to doing what I was doing before I had emergency surgery, and that's doing this here radio show, live stream, and podcast. The several transitions that I've gone through during this time have one thing in common. They've all been nightmares that all lead back to the worst, most frightening nightmare of them all, and that is the realization, again, that this is hell. Following that hilarious monologue on our nightmarish reality, we shared an interview with writer Ben Wallace-Wells from way back in 2007. Back then, Ben was writing for Rolling Stone, and he was willing to come on the show, which he isn't willing to do anymore as he writes for the New York Times. Uh, But he was on back then to discuss his latest writing at the time, an article headlined How America Lost the War on Drugs. So uh, subscribe to This Is Hell on Patreon at patreon.com slash thisishell to hear what's happening as we transition back to whatever it was we were doing here on This Is Hell before I got sick, and a 15-year-old interview from a New York Times writer who will no longer appear on our show about the U.S. losing the war on drugs, a war that this year, in 2022, turns 50 years old. Dan, please remind us what is this week's question from hell and tell us how our listeners are responding so far. Remember, this week's question from hell is, the right to which hobby do you want to see enshrined in a constitutional amendment? And we have had several responses. All right, let's hear them. Our own Jeffy D says lawn darts or jarts. <laughs> My brother got stabbed right in the back with one of those during a jarts game. Yeah, I heard they were really dangerous. Yeah, they were very dangerous. He adds also drunk driving. <laughs> wow. 
Yeah, I, I was thinking my answer might be I'd like to ride my bicycle on the interstate, but I'm not sure I want to if <laughs> exactly. Jeff's going to be drunk driving. <laughs> exactly. Good point. Brayden S. says gay sex. <laughs> all right. He wants to protect that pastime. Sure. That's all we've had so far, although I'm sure the answers are coming in. Yes. Oh, that's so far. Okay, we yes, have. we have plenty more coming in, I'm sure, because people are trying to figure out exactly which hobby they want to have protected by a constitutional amendment. It's time for nasty, gnarly, nauseous, naughty, nerdy, icky, drippy, sticky, goopy, gloppy, globby, gory this week in rotten history. On June 3rd, 1943, 79 years ago Thursday, in a predominantly Mexican-American neighborhood of Los Angeles, about a dozen sailors from a nearby U.S. Navy base hopped off a bus, encountered a group of young men from the neighborhood, and got into an ugly fight. As we all know, most fights are ugly. This fight must have been really ugly or would not have been labeled as such during rotten history. So the next day, about 200 uniformed club-carrying sailors arrived in taxi cabs and began circulating through the streets, beating up young Mexican-American men. Because you do not take public transit if your plans are to terrorize a community. You take a cab. Uh, Though the unprovoked attacks were motivated mainly by racism, the sailors claimed they were angry because the local men wore zoot suits, trendy flamboyant garments, that some viewed as unpatriotic because the long jackets, wide lapels, and baggy pants use a lot of fabric, which was being rationed for use by U.S. troops in World War II. In other words, the sailors were claiming they were simply militarized fashionistas who were concerned about wartime resource allocation. Amid simmering ethnic tensions in Southern California, zoot suits had also become associated with gang violence. Local news media had encouraged white people and police to view any Latino wearing a zoot suit as a draft-dodging troublemaker. But don't mention that in U.S. public schools because it might make white kids feel bad to learn that white racist sailors terrorize a community, an entire neighborhood, during World War II based on their racism. In L.A., the so-called zoot suit riots went on for days. Thousands of white sailors, marines, and civilians filled the neighborhoods, uh, barging into shops and movie houses to grab Mexican-Americans, Filipinos, and black youths and just pound on them, which is the kind of thing we do not remember when Memorial Day rolls around every year. Some men wearing zoot suits were tackled and stripped to their underwear. The white attackers piled up the suits on the sidewalk and set them on fire. Local police looked the other way because, of course, they did as cops enforced fascist white supremacy regularly during the war on fascism overseas. Some cops even joined in the racist attacks and arrested the victims when they fought back, naturally. Almost a week passed before the sailors and marines were ordered back to their barracks, bringing the riots to an end. By then, more than 600 neighborhood residents had been arrested, but only a few, very few servicemen were also arrested, and local news media generally took their side. Meanwhile, zoot suits became a symbol of ethnic pride and defiance, and when First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, in her syndicated newspaper column, called the resistance by the local residents a, quote, racial protest, the L.A. Times responded with an editorial accusing her of communist sympathies. Yes, Eleanor Roosevelt, communist, is what the L.A. Times expressed after a racist attack on Mexican-Americans that was supported by the local police force. That's right, when the first lady of the United States called what was clearly a racial protest a racial protest, she was labeled a communist. Today, the far right on media outlets like Fox News Channel would call her out for being woke, if not a woke communist. And is there anything really worse? Also in Rotten History on June 4th, 1923, 99 years ago this Saturday, at the Belmont Park racetrack in New York, bookmakers had posted a horse named Gimme as a three to five favorite in the two mile steeplechase because back then gamblers would bet on anything involving horses. To be honest, I'm surprised they didn't stage horse fights. But once the horses were off, it quickly became a race between Gimme and a five-to-one horse named Sweet Kiss, whom few horse players had considered a serious contender. Riding Sweet Kiss was a 22-year-old Irish immigrant named Frank Hayes, who after working for some years as a horse trainer and stable tender, was finally getting his long-desired first chance to compete as a jockey. Hayes piloted sweet uh, sweet kiss like a pro as the horse gracefully jumped ditches and hurdles because steeplechase is dangerous and 
stupid. Sweet Kiss moved out ahead of the favorite, Gimme, and won the race by a length and a half. The spectators cheered the underdog novice jockey as Sweet Kiss triumphantly crossed the finish line, and then they burst into laughter when Hayes, the jockey, suddenly fell off the horse. But the laughter stopped when Hayes did not get up. Doctor ran out onto the track and quickly determined that Jockey Hayes was dead. He had suffered a heart attack, probably brought on by his effort before the race to lose 12 pounds in little over a day. Under pressure by the horse's owner to shed the weight, Hayes had gone on a frantic binge of jogging, starving himself, and refusing to drink water, rapidly shrunk from 142 pounds to 130. He had looked tired and weak when he climbed onto the saddle on race day. Hayes' mother, who had opposed her son's ambition to be a jockey, learned of his death by reading it in the paper that afternoon. The Belmont Park, because the police do their job so well, the Belmont Park Jockey Club quickly waived some of their rules to make the victory official, and Frank Hayes became the only athlete in history known to have won a sports competition while dead. The horse Sweet Kiss never raced again and quickly acquired the nickname The Sweet Kiss of death. Now that's rotten history, and this is hell. Dan, do we know who our guests are coming up on this week's This Is Hell? Yes, we do. Tomorrow, attorney and legal scholar Joseph Margulies is author of Thanks for Everything, Now Get Out, Can We Restore Neighborhoods Without Destroying Them? <laughs> that's a great title for a book. Yeah. And then Thursday, Adrian Shirk, author of Heaven is a Place on Earth, Searching for an American Utopia, uh, an, uh, an exploration of American ideas regarding utopia during late-stage capitalism. I am your bitter, blind, broke, gap tooth radio show uh, podcast and live streaming host, Chuck Mertz. I'm laughing because in my script it says, I'm your bitter, blind, bork, <laughs> gap tooth radio show host. One more email. Eric S. wrote to us at Chuck at com a few weeks ago when I was still stuck in bed at home post-surgery. Eric says, hey, Chuck, hope you're feeling better. Can't wait to have This Is Hell return. I've learned so much from the show and listening to it as is one of the best parts of my day. I've sent an email to Alex a while back saying the same, but you guys can count on my support on Patreon at patreon.com slash thisishell for as long as I'm able to do so. I'd love to one day visit Chicago and Carrie's Lounge and participate in one of those drink and thinks I've heard so much about, but it's a long way from Brazil. Who knows, though? Wish you a speedy recovery. All the best, Eric. Thanks, Eric. As for what until the end, uh, pandemic was our weekly meet and greet, that's really a drink and think. This is Hell Office Hours, which happened every Wednesday night downstairs at Carrie's. Eric and everyone listening right now, if you are traveling to Chicago for something related to the show, visit the weekend of Saturday, September 17th for the This Is Hell anniversary party, also at Carrie's. However, this past Wednesday, I did come over here on Wednesday evening and made an appearance, and not only did I see producer Alex Jerry, but I also ran into a few other listeners, and despite only hanging out for about an hour, I had a fantastic time, and now more than ever, I, I really miss office hours, and I guess I have to go on missing our weekly office hours because the pandemic is surging here in Chicago again. Finally, earlier I mentioned attending a memorial service for a friend of mine this past Memorial Day weekend. Like I said, he was a huge music fan. He, music was his life. Uh, that's all he really focused on. He ran an independent record label. He was a record producer himself, a record store owner, a musician. His life was music. The memorial service for my friend was at a club in San Francisco and was live streamed, so I attended virtually. Friends shared stories, and of course, they were all about music one way or another. One story was about how he and some of his friends, who were also passionate about music, traveled from San Francisco to the East Coast a few years ago to see a series of five Bob Dylan concerts. Not that I'm a huge fan. And they attended all of them. As the story goes... Uh, my friend and a f very close friend of his uh, were at one show passing a joint back and forth. However, there was someone in between them who did not indulge, so they had to keep apologizing and saying, excuse me, as they handed the other one the spliff. At one point, they recognized the person standing between them who had no interest in getting high, and I can only imagine their reaction when they finally realized that the person separating them was none other than 1990s star of the sitcom The Nanny, Fran Drescher. Personally, if I was getting stoned at a show and had to pass a joint around The Nanny, I would not have been able to keep my act together 
believing she was a mere hallucination, and I probably would have burst out into laughter over and over again. Instead, they just kept saying, Excuse me, Fran. See, we told you. This is hell. My demon is on my butt. No. Uh. My demon talks to me in profanity like a seller. Uh -huh. And my demon tries to knock me down. And my demon tries to put me on a hell ride. Thank you for listening to This Is Hell. For more interview hell and to support the show, visit thisishell.com. <laughs>